this day the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. The institution of the synagogue, these assemblies that took place on the Sabbath day, are from the 6th century before our Lord. They are developed especially around the Babylonian captivity. So while the temple was functioning and it existed before its destruction, the, all of the grown men were obliged to go to the three main festivals of the temple in Jerusalem. But what happened at the time of the captivity, when Babylon attacked Judea and dragged off the people of Israel into captivity, the temple was also destroyed at the same time. And while they were in exile, what the people did quite naturally then was find a replacement. And they gravitated around the rabbis, the teachers of the law. And what they did is they formed an assembly, or a gathering, which is what the word synagogue means. It's not even a Hebrew word. Synagogue is a Greek word. And these assemblies would meet then on the Sabbath day. The temple was destroyed. There were no more sacrifices. And they would gather in order to study the word of the scriptures of the prophecies. And any of the men of Israel could be called upon to make commentaries on the law. Now, some of you may have Jewish friends. We all know the word bar mitzvah when these 12 and 13 year olds go through this ceremony. Bar mitzvah means the son of the law. And these boys at 12 or 13, part of the ceremony is they have to read the scriptures in the synagogue. They have to memorize a number of the prayers that are part of the synagogue services. And this is what our Lord is doing. He had been bar mitzvah. We are told that in the gospel at the age of 12, and so he is able to make commentaries on the law. That's what's taking place here today. The chief of the synagogue gives him the scroll to read from Isaiah. And what is being read today is chapter 61 of the Gospel of, Isaiah, of the uh, prophet Isaiah. Now, in historical context, what is going on here? We are told that our Lord is led by the Spirit back to Galilee. Or back from where? Now the chapter 1 and chapter 2 of St. Luke, you know, they're all of our beloved stories of Christmas. St. Luke recounts the Annunciation, the birth of our Lord, etc. What chapter 3 is, is our Lord's beginning of His public ministry. He is baptized in the Jordan with John the Baptist. The heavens open, all the things that it seemed that you will know. And what he then does is he leaves. We know from the Gospel of St. John, he goes to Cana. He returns to Galilee. All that St. Luke tells us is that he goes back north to Galilee. But we know from the Gospel of St. John, he goes to a wedding. And there's a changing of water into wine. We are also told in the Gospel of St. Luke that our Lord performs miracles in Capharnaum. Capharnaum is a town on the coast of the Sea of Galilee. It's the town where Simon Peter is from, and Andrew, his brother. And the gospel always rotates around this village, not Nazareth. Nazareth, we actually find out, is quite hard-hearted. It's where our Lord will say that no man is a prophet in his own country. So what this, we're told at the beginning of this gospel, then, is following the baptism of our Lord, St. Luke gives us a genealogy of our Lord, going backward from his parents all the way back to Adam, and he says that Adam was of God. Because what St. Luke is laying out for us is that this work of the Messiah is a redemption of all of the human race. All of the children of Adam are to be redeemed. In chapter 4, then, he is brought back to Nazareth. And it's at this point that we're told that in his return, he is appearing in the synagogue on this Sunday. Now, what is then taking place is he reads this prophecy, that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. There we go. <laughs> so I guess we'll just hear, I thought for one time I didn't have to wear my microphone, I can finally get rid of this thing, and now I can wear it from the beginning. So what takes place in the synagogue is that our Lord reads the prophecy which everyone in Israel 
knew was messianic. This was an announcement of a, or an outstanding journey, but it might go off again. I gotta put this thing back up. He winds up announcing this messianic prophecy. Everyone knows this is referring to the Christ to come. Our Lord reads this. Everyone in Nazareth has heard about the miracles in Capernaum, in Cana. He's heard of the miracles, and now they're waiting. What's he going to do for us? After all, he's grown up with us. We know this young man. He's been with us the whole time. This is the son of Joseph. This is the carpenter's son. He's done wonderful things in Capernaum. He's done wonderful things in Cana. What are we going to get? Huh? What are we going to get? And that's why when he reads this prophecy of Isaiah, which is Messiah, and he makes no commentary on it, he just goes back to his place in the synagogue and he sits. Which is why St. Luke tells us that everyone starts looking at him quite intent. There's no commentary. Don't say anything. And our Lord simply looks back at him in the synagogue and he says, This day, this scripture has been fulfilled in your sight. Well, this is shocking to them. They're expecting to give us a show, do something, heal somebody around him, take away this of the Gilakadi's leprosy, do something around him, right? Fix her for her arthritic arm. And all he does is he says, The Messiah has come. And clearly indicating. Not directly, but clearly indicating that it's in this person. Now, that's all we're told in this gospel today. As I, as I always encourage you, go back and read chapter 3, chapter 4 of St. Luke today. It's what you have the day free for. Not to have lunch and barbecues all day long. Stop for at least 20 minutes and read the scriptures. Pray a bit, huh? Because what we're told then is the people are not happy with this. They are upset because he's not offering to do anything here. In fact, later on in the Gospels, we are told that our Lord does not perform miracles in Nazareth because of their unbelief. Familiarity breeds content. And here they had grown up in their midst, God incarnate. So imagine the Mother of God, who is certainly in the synagogue. She'd be in the, she'd be in the mosques, in the galleries, with the ladies. But imagine all these things. Her son has been gone for four months. She saw him at the wedding. And now he's back home. And he's already initiated this whole public ministry because of her at Canaan, changing water into wine. So imagine the mother of God is in the gallery and she's watching this. Because then what our Lord says to them, he says, surely you're going to say to me, physician, heal yourself. We have nothing to learn from you. You don't want to make a commentary on Isaiah? That's fine. You have nothing to teach us anyways. You're just a carpenter's son. They turn their disappointment into antagonism and aggression. So then our Lord then goes on to say, there were many widows in Israel at the time of Elijah. But Elijah is only sent to the widow of Sarepta in Sidon, which is now southern Lebanon. In other words, Elijah didn't heal or give food or remedy to the drought for three years to any of the widows of Israel. He was sent to a pig. And in his successor, Elisha's time, there were many lepers in Israel. But the only leper that Elisha ever healed, Eliseus, Elisha, that he healed was Alam, the general of Damascus, Syria, the Syrian general. Again, another not Israel another pagan. And at this point, what our Lord is pointing out to them, his commentary on Isaiah is that I have been sent to preach to the nation's freedom, liberty, from the bondages of sin, to announce the good tidings to the poor, to the little ones of the world. And in giving those examples of Elijah and Elisha, he makes this crowd furious. And they actually accost our Lord and they hustle him out of the synagogue in order to throw him off the cliff that Nazareth was built on. This is the first attempt. This is four months after our Lord. Three months, three, four months that our Lord is beginning his ministry. And this is the first attempt on his life. But as St. Luke tells us at the end of the Gospel, in chapter, six, uh, chapter 4, 
What he tells us is our Lord passed through their midst and went his way. We have no idea what that's supposed to mean. He has an entire group of probably 100, 150 people who have just grabbed him and dragged him out. Again, put yourself in what must be going through the mind and the heart of the Mother of God. You're sitting in the gallery, and all of a sudden your son, who you know to be the Chosen One and God Himself incarnate, being hustled out to be killed. Your 30-year-old son, your boy, your baby. What must be the horror? And then as a mother to know, I initiated this in Canaan, in the changing of water to wine. This is the beginning of my piercing of my immaculate heart. Our Lady of Sorrows. And yet we're told our Lord passes through his midst. This is a marvelous thing because there's numerous times in which they come to arrest our Lord, to kill our Lord, to put him in prison throughout the next three years. And he always escapes. He always gets away. And this is key. And remember for next year for Good Friday. This is key because Judas, when he does his thing, he thinks it's going to be the same. So what does this have to do for us? Well, why are these people in Nazareth who watch this young man grow up and be a child, at least a young child, so angry? It's because they have their own concepts, their prejudgments. That's what the word prejudice actually means. A prejudgment. It's supposed to be this way. And their conceptualization is the way something is supposed to be. And this young man is not conforming to those religious ideas. And as a result, they are angry. They are doing exactly what they are not supposed to be doing. Grace that is given to us is given to us only in the present moment. We cannot change what we've done last week. We can repent of it. We cannot change what we do next week, because we may not even be here. The only moment of sanctity is this present moment of grace, which means we have to be disposed to accept that God's providence may show us a way of something different from my own prejudice, my own prejudgments. And I have to be ready to adapt my life and to follow that providence of infinite wisdom of God. And this is what the majority of the people in that synagogue that day were not capable of doing. He is not conforming to their religious prejudice. He is not conforming to their religious conceptions. And as a result, they try to kill him. This regression that comes out is because they are not accepted. There is a humility that is required of us to correspond to grace. Because we correspond to something that God is communicating to us now. The next step we take is meant to be inspired by grace, not by that concept we had the moment before of how it is supposed to be. And that is the first clash. And that's why this episode that St. Luke gives us, who gives us all these beautiful stories in the beginning, gives us this first conflict and this first crash, which for us individually we have to take to heart. And to ask our Lord that He open our hearts, that He allow us to see. We sang to Him in the beginning, Lord, we desire to see the Messiah. We desire to see Jesus. But not Jesus that we have preconceived in our minds, but how Jesus truly wishes to reveal Himself, himself in our lives. Doing that, we convert. Doing that, we become holy. Doing that, we follow a very mysterious path but which one is guaranteed to be filled with beauty and goodness, perhaps with a lot of pain, but profoundly one of peace and beauty. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Merciful and holy Lord and Father, through your only begotten Son, you have prepared this spiritual banquet for us. Accept the offering of this bloodless sacrifice and grant us the gift of your Holy Spirit. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with pure hearts and divine love, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever.
our salvation, your only begotten Son, became flesh of the pure Virgin Mary, and by his divine plan he saved and redeemed us. Give me a Of conscience, 
sin so that none of your faithful may perish. Rather, make us worthy to live by your Spirit and lead in your life. And we raise glory to you now and forever.
lowly servants, and made worthy to pray with purity and holiness, and to call upon you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Yes, O oh Lord, lover of all people, deliver us from the evil one, and from his deceitful ways. And do not forsake us, lest temptation overcome us. For yours is the kingdom, with your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Let us bow our heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who are taken, and receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you, faithful people, who bow before you. Deliver us from all harm and make us worthy to share in these divine mysteries, purity, and holiness. That through them we may be forgiven and made holy. We raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. The grace of the most holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts of the holy, with perfection and purity and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for He is one in heaven and on earth, to Him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins.
give you the living blood to drink, O Lord, of all people, and have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord, O compassion and merciful one. O God, of all people, have mercy on us.